mate, uh, your bike riding prowess has recently been called into question for those. Okay, yeah. for it, those here you go, then. Oh, it's um, fairly uh, confronting. Jesus, mate. Are you happy yeah. for us to show this on, on YouTube? You're, you're okay with that? Yeah, yeah, general. Yeah, no, look, that that's fine. I'm not too fast. Yeah. Um, yeah, this uh, isn't my first cycling accident, so you're right to uh, call into question my uh, ability to stay upright. So, although each of the, I went through them with my wife in the hospital on the day after the accident, and I mean, some of them, are, it, it's weird. I've been riding for a long, long time, and some of them are quite innocuous where. Your kind of front wheel hits a bit of dirt that's been left on a weekend or whatever somewhere and you don't see it at five in the morning you slide out break a hand break a couple of ribs whatever but you just kind of keep keep riding finish the ride and realize later on you hurt yourself a couple of others have been a kangaroo jumped into me like not me hitting a kangaroo a kangaroo jumped and hit me um another one was an old lady opened the car door and just as i was riding past her car she was quite short couldn't see her and mm. i can't Knocked myself out, separate, separated my AC joint, four ribs, punctured lung, a couple of other things during that accident. And uh, that was not, that was, I was in hospital for uh, probably about four days. And then other times, again, just innocuous things, broken pelvis, broken collarbone on my left hand side. This time I did, mm. evened it up and did on the right hand side. So, yeah. I think that that ends my cycling career here. Here yeah, ends you, my career. You're hanging it up, you reckon? Hanging up the lock. Yeah, right? yeah. My wife's been very good not to ever push me to give it up because she knows how much I love it. But you know, the camaraderie, the kind of mateship, the good banter, the fitness side of it. But I think uh, this time, this was a pretty close call. It could have easily been either major brain injury, paraplegic, quadriplegic, or death you know it was in fact the guys I was with I was knocked out for a good minute or so they were they were I think pretty concerned when they saw me laying there with blood pissing out a, a hole in my head and helmet wrecked and me just mm. not moving for for some time so yeah I think it's fairly confronting for them well, I mean I wasn't aware of it I kind of just woke up and then decided everything was okay as you do when adrenaline's pumping I'm in the middle of the road cars have stopped just make sure I'm not getting run over. And then I start rotating my arm going, oh, I think I'm okay. I think I'm good. Little did I know it was a dislocated shoulder plus a broken clavicle mm. uh, into four pieces. And then they said, just stay there because you might have spinal injuries. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And, you know, again, adrenaline pumps, mm. stand up, sit down on a little um, fence just on the side of the road, someone's front fence with a broken pelvis that's smashed, smashed to bits. And, again, mm. I'm not feeling anything. I'm just going, oh, I think I'm okay. And then I think something clicked and I realised, yeah, maybe I'm not feeling so great. So I called <laughs> them in. So, uh, and then it was a lot of internal bleeding, which was the concern. They said it was called a sneaky bleed where you get internal injuries where you can't find where they are. So you're losing blood pressure. They had to do mm. a couple of transfusions and then they're thinking, you know, if we don't find this and nip it in the bud, then we're in trouble. So, so that was um, probably more confronting for my wife hearing that mm. and I was awake and then they said we haven't got time to put you under so just we'll give you a local put a little curtain up in front of your face and we'll sort of operate on you and they just said stay still and I just had to stay still for about an hour and a half while I do these embolization coils where they put these coils and you know through your uh the main artery coming out of your groin ephemeral artery and they just stick it up through there and just open these little coils three millimeter coils that stop the bleed so they did four of them and so yeah Full, I'm full of metal and screws, and it's going to be fun going through the airport uh, during the tour, that's for sure. Well, for, <laughs> the, for a fellow with an engineering background, you, you'd surely find all this quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, you learn a lot about stuff that you really would prefer not to know anything about. You kind of learn all sorts of terms. and Because uh, this frame, um, you know, I don't know if you, you can see, but the frame, the frame kind of goes into your body. Yeah. These two, these two spikes here go sort of straight in and hold the pelvis structurally and so forth. But they're going through open wounds. So you've got open wounds that are just kind of almost getting elongated because every time you move and stand up or sit down or whatever, it's not like a broken arm where you have ex external fixtures which are kind of just staying in place. These are mm. getting elongated. And so the open wound, which is kind of, 
you know, you got to watch for infection and stuff. It's all all pretty gory and pretty awful. Anyway, so uh, anyway, touch wood. I uh, hopefully we'll be back on stage and playing and doing. Um, there was a bit of concussion, so I had double vision for about two or three weeks, which was concerning. Um, I could form memories, but I couldn't see sort of distance, double vision and stuff. So that's all cleared up now. So oh, good. They're, they're the things you'd worry about, you know, having, you know, to be dependent on other people or not being able to do your job that I do as my main job outside the band, you know, which is engineering and stuff. So, mm. so yeah, you just a uh, couple of... Couple of rooms down, there was someone not as fortunate as me, young young girl, bike rider, and yeah, quadriplegic, paralysed from the neck down, and having to breathe through a tube. So you think it's kind of dangerous. That's the problem with cycling and cars. You know, I think a lot of people just think, of, you know, fucking cyclists, road flies of the highway or mm. whatever. But everyone riding a bike is a, a you know, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister. You know, it's just people trying to get fit. And enjoy cycling. Mm. It's just like car versus bike. You're always going to have, set, you know, cyclist is always going to be second, uh, second best. So never good. But um, yeah. yeah, you get a lot of abuse. In fact, when I first because uh, I started shaving my legs probably ten years ago, and I got on stage, and I'm thinking, I don't think many of our fans will be cycling. <laughs> <laughs> fans, I'm thinking. I think most of them are yelling at me most of the time, not in a good way, out of the. Out of windows of cars, going get off the road, you, you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, what was so, your yeah. uh, what was the first thing your brother said to you when he saw you in hospital? Was he was he understanding? Or was he like, oh, yeah? Well, it was kind of it was weird. I actually thought about while well, I think I was getting loaded into the ambulance. I was thinking because normally I think, oh, Jesus, now I'm gonna, you know, I'm fit at the moment. Now I'm gonna get unfit and I'm gonna have to work back. I had a little bit of that, but then I. Had this realization. Fuck, there goes the tour. You know, they. You know, we're, we're supposed to be touring in a month. There's no way. You know, it was weird. I was not sure how injured I was. I knew I was injured, but you know, I thought, oh, you know, if I've broken a per, um, clavicle, I won't be able to play. Um, John, I think he came in on the. It happened on the Thursday. He came in on a Saturday, I think, and he was obviously contacted by my wife. And my wife said, uh, my wife was very caring. Uh, you know, on, on the day. And then I think the second day she was into fury and frustration and, you know, and John, I think, said something to her like, I'll be nice to him for the first day until I get really mad about what's, what's happened. But it, it's weird, actually. As it just turned out, I was just contacted uh, Eli about something uh, about an hour ago. Eli's had a um, really bad influenza flu virus that's going around, L laid him up for about 15 days, and John's just come off the back of the same thing. So he had about three weeks of unable to get to work, unable to get out of bed. So I think for whatever reason, this tour was not meant to be <laughs> at the time it was. Because <laughs> even had I been okay, they said they couldn't have rehearsed, they couldn't have practised. They had absolute, you know, John has a bad chest, gets um, uh, you know, pneumonia very easily, bronchitis and stuff. So for whatever reason, on off the rails, I think it was, which we were supposed to be playing this last weekend, mm. was just not for us so we never never got there so who knows some if you believe in some higher higher god then uh it was giving us a message well i was I mean, half expecting i was half expecting to read that off the rails you know had some terrorist attack and everyone got yeah. bombed <laughs> you know fortunately that didn't happen but i was just thinking man there's just something weird that, that everything's conspiring against us to get out on the road for this tour even even ill at ease you know the tour it's been three or four years in the making to try and get out on the road. Uh, yeah, I remember talking with you about it in uh, in 2019 when we first met. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it was scheduled for 2020. Yeah, 2020 was the 25th anniversary. We were going to do it then. And then uh, obviously the pandemic happened and we went, okay, well, let's pause it for a year. And then beginning of 21, we announced, hey, we're coming out again. And then, of course, we had yet another uprising of uh, cases so we couldn't play. And then... That was then 21, 22, I can't remember what happened there, but I think it was, yeah, that's right. We really want to release a vinyl version of the album in commemoration of the anniversary, and all the pressing plants were not able to meet the schedule of having the having the record ready. So we said, oh, let's just push it into 2023. And originally it was going to be early 23, 
Uh, and then, you know, other things conspired, getting remixes of the album and everything. It's, and then it kind of pushed back to the September, October period now. It's kind of November, December, January, but we'll see. And that's assuming I'm fit enough to do the the shows, the first shows in um, Adelaide on the 25th. So depending on my rehab, once I get this cage off, which should possibly be in about 10 days, hopefully I'm good because all the cycling injuries have healed, mm -hmm. all my, my clavicle, you know, which was this arm, all fixed and solid, solid as a rock. Even within a couple of days, I was able to weight bear on this, which just because they got a plate in there. Mm -hmm. Ribs are healed, everything else is healed. So now it's really just uh, once the cage comes off because it's pinched a nerve in my leg and it's kind of painful because of that, once the cage comes off, assuming that fixes the pinched nerve, then I just got to work out can I stand, you know, wide-legged with yeah. a grimace on my face for, you know, an hour and a half of a show. So, But this, well, I mean, this time the pain will be real. The grimace will be yeah. real. There'll <laughs> be no faking it, so... Well, so, yeah. I remember having a laugh. Someone on one of the the team up groups managed to um, they literally just drew the band in stick figure, and you were instantly recognisable. <laughs> no, that that's a friend of ours, Herman Laus, who was in a couple of well, seminal Adelaide bands around here, Fear and Loathing, and other uh, bands that my brother played with, and we kind of knew from the scene way back. And Herman. Um, we're actually putting that out as a T-shirt for this tour because uh, our manager saw it and said, I love that cartoon stick figure. It's so great. Yeah. And so we asked Herman, are you happy if we put it on? I think it's going to be one of the tour T-shirts. We've got, we got a bunch of merch coming out for this for this tour in particular, doing the old T-shirts, doing some sweatshirts, uh, a couple of work shirts, a tour shirt, which will probably be that stick figure. And then we've got a jacket that's yet to be released with some patches on it, some uh, – different team op patches for those that wish to uh and some people will just buy patches and put it on a denim jacket but well they can buy a yeah. jacket for a... so yeah we've got lots of merch coming out so it should be uh we're looking forward to getting out actually it's it's been one of those tours that we've anticipated and loved the thought of doing it and now finally we'll get to realize it which would be cool i look forward to doing some damage to my wallet uh at your merch at your merch. Yeah, very good, very good. Some some of the stuff I should say, Artists First, who we now use for merch, because I always used to do the merch out of my back shed and back in the day we used to do our own printing of shirts. These days, and, and when we were touring, we would have someone doing our merch for us. Um, but they actually went bust as a result of the pandemic because none of the international bands are touring, so they just couldn't make uh, it. Yeah. They had to close. But Artists First is now looking after selling our merch for us. just takes takes away from me having to send stuff out hand packing stuff uh, out of my kitchen all the time so they're now doing it but some of the stuff that we've released online will probably sell out potentially before i mean i'm sure they'll restock for the shows but uh, mm. just probably a message for those that are just thinking ah, I'll wait for the show because the other thing is the record's obviously for sale already one of the things we didn't want people to do because we used to have this during the battle sick one that people would buy the record at the show put it at the clo uh, you know, cloak store say hey, you know hey, could you look after this for my cloak they'd come back and they'd they'd bought three records but there'd only be one in their bag and they're like what happened you know so or yeah. or that was the record on the way home or you know so we figured people can order the record get it delivered mm -hmm. and, uh, i just got the test pressings for illities delivered yesterday and i listened to it it's sounding great we we did a couple of fixes on it couple of um the sample uh the snare we never were happy with the snare sound in that recording mm. it's kind of a long story associated with, associated with that but it was always kind of the bane of that sound and um aaron at the time we bought him a piccolo snare um a brass piccolo snare because that's what we knew john stanier used in helmet we really liked the sound john stanier had this is before john joined mm. but in the end, and a Kevlar um, drum head, a, a snare head. But for whatever reason, Aaron never quite got the tuning right, and it just sounded like a block of wood. It didn't have the crack that Stanny used to get for helmet. Just had a real wood wood block kind of sound to it. So um, even Rollins didn't like it. Um, but it, we just it's what we had. It's what we went through. We'd already recorded the songs by the time Rollins came down to mix, so we just had to go with it. But fortunately, Eli is a master at um, 
yeah, studio type stuff. So he was able to take a sample and we were able to re- replace that snare with a sampled snare sound that sounded so so much better and remastered the whole record. Um, and it sounds so good. And really cut it on vinyl with Cooking Vinyl, who are the guys who are doing the re-release. And uh, they're really conscious of making sure that the grooves are really deep and, and cut well. So and we're putting that out in, um, I think it's in Matt, Matt Gray vinyl for that record. And then we've got a live, uh, I think, the Livid, um, the Livid songs coming out live. Mm. So I've got a test pressing of that. So they're sounding really, really good. And... We've turned the bass up on Italy, so that's, you know, how can you not be happy with that when the bass is louder than uh, it used to be? So. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was... Yeah, I when I, I interviewed Henry um, uh, earlier... Oh, when he just came out. Yeah, just just recently. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, he insisted it was only a, an emailer. But, um, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I've chatted to him before, but that was way back in, like, 2005. So this time I think he was just very... You know, he, I think I think his big thing is he just likes to be able to do it in his own time, which is fair. Yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, we spoke a bit about um, about this process, and yeah, he did mention the mention the snare. What was it? Uh, what was he like to work with? Yeah, it was it was a weird kind of a uh, couple of weeks because Henry is typically. As, as you know, Henry's kind of got that working principle, the Bushido, Bushido principle of, you know, samurai, you know, you must work constantly, you must, you know, suffer and all that stuff. And he'd come out and he had a limited amount of time and we kind of um, picked him up. I used to pick him up most days and take him to the studio, which was great because we would sit in the car and talk about, you know, it was probably a 40-minute drive out to the studio, talk about all sorts of stuff. And... Um, it was kind of like your own spoken word thing, but it was just a private conversation between you and Henry, which was great because we were big fans, obviously, and um, had got to know him, and, but really got to know him more and more during that two weeks that he was here. Um, and he was just so passionate for the music. He, We'd already recorded all the tracks, so the tracks were down already in um, its studio, uh, Tony Nesky's studio here in Adelaide, and he was a very good engineer. He'd got great sounds down, uh, with the exception of obviously the snare we weren't that happy with but everything was done so really it was just a mix it was really henry coming in and although i think it says produced by henry it's really mixed by henry Uh, and henry was uh working on it most of the time john and i and aaron were in the studio sometimes i think john and i had to work um but yeah it was and a lot of the time we would sit in the kitchen at the studio and just talk uh just hear stories from henry it was like your own little private spoken word uh, show but he was great it was passionate we asked uh, at the time the the desk that we were using was not a electronic desk that you kind of just programmed where you want to do shifts and fades and so forth so we'd have at times all of us standing at the desk with different um parts to play during the song you know lift the guitars in this part drop them here turn this up turn that reverb up so it was kind of almost like a game of twister around of kind of the um the main mixing desk, which was kind of weird, but um, and Henry'd get a bit upset if we didn't get it right. So yeah, it was good. He was he was a driven individual as he always has been and was back then. So it was good. having someone that we looked up to in terms of what he'd done musically and the Rollins band. We toured with the Rollins band and played with and all the guys in the Rollins band. We got on really well with having have someone that you kind of admire in terms of their musical career and so forth, to come and say, you know, what you guys are doing is killer. I love what you're doing. I want to take you to the US and start destroying bands, starting with all those bands, starting with A and, you know, end with the band starting, you know, with Z or Z or whatever it is in the Mm. US. He was so passionate about it and wanting to do so many things without real, I mean, I think he got some points on the album, you know, uh, payment, but whether it, I don't know if it ever recouped that album, probably never did um, recoup. Um, so he really never got paid for it, and yet he was just so passionate about it. So, you know, it was pretty pretty cool for us to hang out with someone who'd been so iconic in music for from the music we liked anyway. So it was a really cool, cool experience. So And to get to go out now, what is it, 28 years after that album was released and uh, go and play those songs is, is going to be good. We've rehearsed them um, leading up 
to my accident, we'd rehearsed for probably about two, two and a half, three months. And they were sounding super good, super tight. I mean, a lot of the songs have been in our set for forever, so it's kind of a no-brainer for us. Interloper, first time, Point Man. Mm. You know, we can kind of play them any day of the week, but it was some of the other al- uh, album songs that we hadn't played for a while. We just had to re- re-remember and relearn, and we're like, man, how do we write this thing? You know, what what the hell are we doing here? So it's kind of kind of weird. But, yeah, looking forward to it. it it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that... Um... Yeah, I, I'm not a drummer, so I don't know. I appreciate good drumming, but I, I, I could never understand, you know, because I don't play it myself, that, you know, you hear a song like Point Man, and apparently it's really, really hard to play when you're a drummer. Super so, yeah, yeah, I'll be fucked if I know why. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's kind of weird. I think, I'm, I'm, and again, uh, forgive me if I've said this before, but, I mean, even Stania, when Stania joined uh, way back when, he kind of went, man, what is this fucking song? He said, man, I did math rock in in Helmet. This is calculus rock. This is just fucking yeah. stupid shit. And because he was, you know, formally trained and, you know, as a percussionist. So he could understand music and he was like, what? This is just a 20, I count to 23, then I count to 19. And I, it was just like, it's just a weird number sequence. We, we just used to laugh. And, and, you know, the way John talks about how he wrote that song, I think he was listening to the drums maybe from first time. As a, as a separate track. And then he started doing this riff over and over. I mean, John is the, he pretty well wrote most of the drums and the guitar and bass on, on that album. Uh, I'm with some exceptions. I wrote a little bit of here. And of course, Aaron, who was playing on the drums, would play elements to it. But John was a drummer as well. So he did a lot of, but he just said to Aaron, just play the first time drums. Don't even think about what we're playing on guitar and bass. And you just play those drums. And we're going to play this riff that's going to bend around it and do sort of weird timing stuff. Interestingly, Eli just recently, I think on either Instagram or Facebook or something, had a video of him playing on the last Battlesick tour, playing Point Man. And because Eli's a, truly a musician, you know, they say drummers are people that hang around with musicians. Eli is a musician who hangs around with two non musicians in the case of the Mark Kane. Eli had written down all the time sequences and on, on the video he kind of says, you know, this is the bass playing, you know, 4-4 four, four while I'm playing this and then this is the bass playing 6-4 while I'm playing So he's kind of explained how complex it truly is. So, but And, and he, he only learnt it by writing it out in music tablature, not drum tablature, music notation, pure mu- music notation. So we said at one stage we should put that on the back of a T-shirt so that if uh, the drummer can't remember how to play it, we can just get the fans to turn around and kind of... <laughs> put the back to you because um, even to this day Stania still has that written out in drum tablature that he keeps in his uh, snare case so if he ever comes back and plays with us he can remember how to play it so. but yeah it's kind of weird I think it's the it's the engineer in John that uh, kind of weird mathematical sequences so it's, it's good fun 10 years at this point since the last uh, Mark of Cain record can you yeah. see yourselves recording new stuff Interesting, John got asked that question probably when we were doing the Battlesick 30-year tour, and his answer was he thinks he's got one more album in him, um, and I think that's probably that's probably true. We've been writing, in fact, during the rehearsals leading up to um, this recent incident, uh, we were playing some new stuff. So uh, there were some new riffs coming. John was bringing along some new riffs. We were muck around with not with the intent to write new material before the tour because it was like we'll always take a longer time to write stuff but i think there probably is one more album left it's always been the the songwriting process in the band has always been a long uh process we're not a band that comes in and jams we don't just kind of say hey you know let's all just jam and see what comes out it's very meticulous john He's a principal songwriter. He gets an idea in his head. He gets a riff in his head. He comes and brings that along and then says, I want the drums to do this. I want this to do that. So it's very um, slow because it's probably so reliant on John. It wasn't like that in the early days, but it became like that in the more recent kind of 15, 20 years. So, uh, so yeah, it's. Um, I, think, I think there's one more. Um, you kind of never want to do a bad album I mean nobody does mm. and you kind of want to make sure that it kind of meets the quality 
standard that we've set for ourselves so that we're not um, compromising or just kind of, I mean, it's never about money making. The band's never been about money making. It's been about artistic outcome. Mm. As we said, you know, you live in Adelaide, you either become a serial killer or you play music to get your anger out. So we kind of, we decided to play music and sing about serial killers. So we kind of, that's just kind of what you got to do in Adelaide for those that well, live in Adelaide. There's the quote for the uh, to promote the yeah. interview. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You got to pick between them. I think mum and dad were pretty pleased we picked music as an outlet. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so it's, it's kind of, yeah, so you're right. It's, I think there's another album, I think, at some point, but kind of we're, we're getting closer to the age of 60. I'm 58, John's 60 now, so it's kind of the Zimmer frames, which we used to joke about, as long as we've got Zimmer frame access, we're thinking, man, we, we maybe shouldn't have joked that because I was, up until a week ago, I was on a Zimmer frame for <laughs> three or four weeks. So so the fact, we were talked about coming on stage with mobility scooters and just twisting the seats and playing <laughs> Playing on the mobility skills that might still happen. Who knows? That's, that's I it. love it, Tim. Thank you. Call for us it. veteran bands. They call us a veteran band now. That's that's a nice way of not not saying you're an old fucker. You're just veteran. <laughs> <laughs> what was um? Oh, what was his face? Totally unicorn. Uh, <laughs> came up with an absolute <laughs> zinger when you guys were. It was so sort of funny. Probably, yeah, in Brisbane, he's like um. Uh, have you guys got work tomorrow? Oh, who are we kidding? You Mark Kane fans, you're all retired. I was like, oh. <laughs> that, was, that was classic. He was brilliant. We loved playing with those guys. They were such such lovely guys. He's such a great front man, the way he gets out oh. and runs around and pouring beers. I think it was that gig in Queensland where he's pouring beers and kind of... At I think the that, zoo, and he, and he climbed zoo. on top of the, um, the, the horse, some animal statue at I remember helping him back on stage after he'd led people to skip with his microphone cord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, cable, that yeah. cable was so... Our manager was telling us, you know, as soon as you leave the stage, you've voided your, your insurance policy for, you know, liability. <laughs> I don't think he cares. I don't think no. he gives a fuck avoiding his insurance liability. Or, or it's probably the venue's liability more, more than anything as soon as a band decides to leave the stage. So... Uh, but he's that uh, he, he's such a lovely guy and um, so funny. And I think he works in the Apple. He's like a genie. He works at the Genius Bar for Apple in an Apple store. You know, what a great thing. You go in and say, hey, my phone's not working. And he shows up and starts helping you. So pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I remember helping him on, back on stage. And uh, I was just so, you know, incredulous because I'd never heard a note of their music. I'm like, where the fuck did they find you? And he goes, Mate, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh, again, we're we're fortunate when we tour. I mean, Tim Pittman, our manager, does a lot of kind of pr- selection of support bands or suggestion of uh, support bands. We're playing with Chimers. Uh, Chimers, I don't know if Chimers played on that leg of the tour. They p- played on the earlier leg of the tour. But that's a great two-piece band, um, drummer and, and guitarist, and do loop things with pedals and stuff. Brilliant, brilliant band. They, they played off the rails uh, this last weekend. We got them on a couple of the shows in the East Coast with uh, Pigs, 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 Pigs mm-hmm. um, from the UK. So that'll be uh, great to have those guys. We're fortunate we get to, like, you know, when you're in a headlining kind of band like the Mark Ain't. we get to pick the kind of bands we want to bring on tour. We did the Mesthetics previously for the Battlestick uh, tour because we were huge fans of Fugazi. We toured with Fugazi. We kind of knew the guys and Mesthetics uh, were keen to come out to Australia. But it's tough for those guys to do a tour and make money just on their own because, you know, th- though there'll be Fugazi fans who go out and see them, they wouldn't kind of play the venues big enough. And you've got international airfares are expensive, or even more yeah. so now, like how it's going to work now. But uh, so, yeah, it's great to play with people that we get on well with, love their music, like the people. It was interesting, Rollins used to have this um, term that he used to call NGBB, you know, nice guys, bad band. You know, <laughs> you play with people and they're nice people, but you just don't like the music. We're fortunate we've had... Nice guys, great bands. So we've not uh, not suffered too many NGBBs, fortunately. Yeah. Oh, nice. uh, Kim, I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys again. Is it the Trippin 
It's not the zoo again this time, I think. Yeah, I am probably should have uh, boned up on that. I think it is the Triffid, yeah. I think, um, again, our management and Tim kind of searches for the right venues, the right size, because you kind of don't want to... Um, you don't want to play too big a venue and not sell enough tickets. And at the same time, you don't want to play too small a venue and sell out and then people complain, hey, I didn't get to see you. So it's really finding that balance. The Adelaide shows in something called the Heinle Street Music uh, Hall, which is a reasonably new venue. I think the same guys that do the two venues up in Queensland, uh, I think Powderfinger, one of the members from Powderfinger is behind some of it. So they're well-designed venues yeah. with great sound, great PA, Great viewing for everyone. So in the Adelaide case, there's tiered kind of three tiered viewing areas. So you can see the band from any vantage point and there's a bar on every level. So just really good venues, which Adelaide probably lacked a venue like that for a while. Mm. Uh, of that capacity, it's about a 1500 capacity venue. So hopefully that's the 25th of November in the start, assuming I'm up once I get this cage off me, I'm fit and able to stand for that period of time with my legs wide apart so uh, mm. anything less won't be tolerated so we'll, worst case we have to shift that one into January but hopefully it'll stay on the 25th and then we'll be on the east coast in middle of December and then finish finish off in the new year so we're really looking forward to it it's um as I said we rehearsed before uh the accident uh which is four and a half, well five weeks ago now and the rehearsals were sounding just rock solid really good so um just looking forward to getting out and um, playing. I mean, Eli hasn't played probably a, maybe five or s- five songs, six songs on the on that album. So um, he's been learning them and uh, working out how to play them. So it's been good. It's yes. going. I, I think we're lucky. That album probably is one of the albums that really created uh, an awakening of other people because Roland's got behind it. Roland said, "Hey, look at these guys. These guys are good." Which it's unfortunate that you need someone like. Rollins to point out local bands to say you should listen to this local band. I think they're good, but I think we we gar- garnered a lot more support from people that otherwise wouldn't have come out and seen us just because they were fans of Black Flag or they were fans of Rollins band. And suddenly, oh, this guy says they're good. Maybe we'll go and see him. And so we had a real big uptick in band attendance and all that kind of stuff. So um, that that album probably was that seminal album that really kicked us into a lot more awareness of and it was what mid 90s 95 so it was a period of great music in australia generally you know the bands that were around back then regurgitator spider bait all those kind of bands you know so many of those bands that we used to play with early days who then overtook us in terms of their popularity and so forth because they played maybe more accessible um music with more hooks and and not one and a half minute intros like we tend to play before any vocals come in. Um, but yeah, it was kind of uh, a great period of, period of time and a great. And I think there's a lot of people even now that will see at those venues and those shows that we play where they bring their kids along who are now old enough, um, or maybe just some young kids that have heard about us and come along and want to see us play. So that'd be good. Next generation, pass it on. Awesome, mate. Interest, interestingly, and uh, I'll shut up in a minute. But uh, that's all right. We got three minutes left on the Zoom, so you go for right, it. Right. Okay. While I was um, recuperating, or well, I've been sitting around, I haven't left the bloody house for uh, five, six weeks. Um, my wife, we'd started cleaning out the shed. We had a whole bunch of stuff, and she, she said, "You know, you got thirty archive boxes at the back of the shed. We just need to clean them out." So. After the accident, I was captive. There was nowhere to run. So she goes, right, we're going through these boxes. We've been going through these boxes. And a lot of them have been, been band boxes with old set lists and old, you know, we had a legal stash with our drummer from LEDs where we kind of went to Supreme Court and all sorts of shit went on in there. And so I'm reading all the stuff. I'm reading letters from Henry and just support our court case. And and then I read kind of my handwritten drawings of the artwork that I wanted for LEDs because I did most of the artwork kind of design for albums and T-shirt design stuff. So I found all this stuff that I think at some point, you know, we'll have to um, catalogue that or get it released somehow. It's kind of all this archival stuff. That, unfortunately, I, my, I said to my wife, I don't want to throw this out. You know, it's kind of important stuff to for maybe someone to catalogue at some point, but um, or maybe never. You know, maybe it was going to bin somewhere, but 
who knows? It was interesting trip down memory lane, thinking about all the things we've been through and all the all the contracts and correspondence we'd had. So yeah, it's kind of was it now eighty four we started. So yeah, it's getting getting up there, almost up for forty years next year. Oof. So, yeah. right. That's old. That's super. It old. is. You've been doing this for. I was born in eighty five. So if that could. <laughs> yeah. The year after our inception, you were conceived. There you go. I was. And and, and we were kind of eight. I was probably 18, yeah, 17, 18, maybe 19. John was kind of two years older. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oof. So, still, no. I think John's concept of keeping a band together by having brothers in it so that you want to beat the shit out of each other but you still stay together as a band was a great concept. I think uh, many other bands haven't survived because uh-huh. of that. That's what it was like. All right, mate. We're about to get kicked off, so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you so much. No worries. Good Have chatting to you. Yeah, no man. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll hang in Brisbane. See you then. We'll see you then. See ya. Right. Bye. Cheers.